And that is a clip from Past Lives. Its writer and director is Celine Song. I'm delighted to say that Celine is in our studio. Hello, Celine. Hi. I'm going to spoil the interview just a little bit by saying that we both love the film. Okay, in fact, slightly more than that. But anyway, we will... We'll... I think you're understating the affection for the film. Okay. We think it's one of the best of the year and we just knocked out by it. Thank you. That means so much. That's it. So you're amongst yeah. friends. So. Yes. In fact, that's kind of the end of the interview. Yeah, really, that's you don't, so need, anyway, don't really need to now the nun too. Um, <laughs> so in, in your words, Celine, dis- describe, describe the movie. So the idea for the movie really uh, started when I actually found myself sitting in this bar in East Village in New York City sitting between my child sweetheart who had come to visit me from, who's not a friend, and my husband who I live with in New York City. And uh, I was translating between these two men, uh, both in language and culture. And eventually, though, at one point, it, it occurred to me that I was translating between two parts of my own self and that these two men know very different sides of me in, in more than, uh, you know, it, it occurred to me to make, make the movie. And I think the movie, I think, ulti- ultimately is about, it's a, it's a love story that spans decades and continents. And it is about the way that uh, this kind of ephemeral connection that we have with each other, that people have with other people, that uh, endures through uh, so much time and space, you know, against all odds. And that scene that you're talking about, which was the which, the starting point for, for this story, that is in also the starting point of the film. Mm-hmm. So you reproduce that, yeah. you reproduce that scene. Translating language, I understand, how do you translate cultures in a three-way conversation? Well, I think some of it is about codes or like h- how your language works even. I think it's it's beyond just the actual words themselves. Sometimes it's a level of politeness or what is a thing that's considered rude and what's not. Some of it is a little bit of, you know, the things that I'm sure that you, you guys can also relate to about like what you grow up with. There's an inside joke that is built into um, every culture. You know, be, grow, having grown up in Canada, there's some... <laughs> there's some jokes or a language or culture thing that I'm sure you guys will see and then will be, you guys will be lost, you know, if I'm laughing about it. There is a, there is a line after the meeting in which uh, she says, he's so Korean, I feel so not Korean when I'm with him, but also more Korean. And I, I loved the way that that kind of described what you're talking about, about the to sort of two parts of of somebody being amplified by being in the company of that person. I, when I watch the film, and this is, it must be terrible when you're a filmmaker that people say, well, these are the films that it made me think of. Mm-hmm. But I thought... Are you, you going to do it anyway? I'm, I'm going to do it anyway, because you can tell me whether you hate any of these. Mm-hmm. I thought, on the one hand, I thought it was like, it reminded me of uh, of the the longing of Wong Kar Wai's In the Mood for Love. I had, there were twinges of the Link Later Before trilogy. I think it's like David Chow's Return to Soul somehow welded onto Sleepless in Seattle. And I think there's some of Ozu's Tokyo story in there. And I also think it's completely its own movie. And I was breathtaken by how good it is. Thank you so much. I'm so Do you nice. hate any of those Can references? I just say that, what, oh, okay. that, wasn't, that wasn't a question, really, was it? That was just... No, it's more of... Well, the thing is, it's very hard when you see... I mean, I spent half the movie thinking, I can't believe this is your first feature. And then I spent the end of the movie thinking, don't mess it up, don't mess it up, don't mess it up, don't mess it up. And then you didn't. We were just discussing, which we weren't... We won't do but, 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 the, but the final three minutes of the film, and you... That's, that's the bit. We were both thinking, is, is that... Is she? Is that what? Anyway, it was and it was perfect. I think that the but the uh, the film is meant to be a knife, but it has to finish the gesture. Yeah. So I feel like the ending is the thing that you're driving to. So yeah. there are some a lot of things that even after I shot everything, I was in the editing room. There are things that I was letting go of just so that the, the sharpness of the ending would work. So I think to me, it's like if if you, I mean, when we were shooting the final. Three minutes. I think the so much of that was very much like you know me running around set, being like, "It's like if you if we met mess this up, the whole movie is gone. We have this right, you know." Um, just mainly to myself. Is that <laughs> is that what you were doing? <laughs> it's funny because I feel like um, what I learned in the first film, and this to me, uh, making the first movie, I, and I'm sure this is true for most directors, but it really was a like a self discovery or a revelation for myself. Uh, per, it's just such a deep and personal thing. In of what like, way? Uh, I think it was a discovery that I am a filmmaker, and that I just—it feels like I, you know, because you have been a playwright. Yeah, I've been yeah. a playwright for ten years. So 
I think that um, I remember second week into shooting, I remember really going home and feeling like, I think that I love met the love of my life, you know? <laughs> and then you're like, I, I just know what I'm going to be doing when I'm 90. But if, no. okay, if we do this thing again, but this isn't a question, this is a statement. It is astonishing to see the level of confidence in a first film. I mean, i really amazed that somebody making their first feature does it, manages to be as boldly in touch with the, with the medium as you are. And it's lovely to hear you say, I discovered that I was a filmmaker. Because we're all sitting there going, yeah, you are <laughs> evidently a filmmaker. Does the coming from the playwright background... Affected. I mean, the fact that you're, you know, you're obviously a writer first. Has that has that affected the way that you're a filmmaker? I, I think without question. And you don't have as many equipment or as many uh, tools at your disposal, but you're just dealing with uh, character, story, uh, dialogue, blocking. It's just the most fundamental parts of dramatic storytelling. And then I think that those skill sets and those experiences just came with me. The real challenge in that situation, really, to me, was, you know, theater is a figurative medium. So time and space moves in a figurative way. And in film, it moves literally. So the thing that I usually talk about when it comes to like what that means to me is if you want to set a story on Mars, in theater, all you need is a room of any size with an audience. And the actor just has to say, we're on Mars, you know? And maybe you want to do a little light change and it's a little red or something. And then you're like, hey, on Mars today. And that's all you need to do to take the audience to Mars. Uh, in film, if you want to set a story on Mars, you have to build Mars mm -hmm. or you have to go to Mars, right? So I think to me, that really was the uh, the hardest transition. So I, But I think that one of the things that I, I learned, and this is again, this, this is the part where it's a little bit of discovery, that like I have so much more faith in the audience's patience in in silence, for example, right? Or like their openness to listen to a conversation, and I think that that faith really does come from my work in theater because I've been in a hushed room where people are just quietly waiting for the next word to come. I think we heard in that in the clip that we played, there are big gaps. I mean, in comparison with the rest of the film, that was pacey dialogue. <laughs> yes. But, there, but there, is, there is a lot of space. I have two theater-based questions. Martin McDonough came on the show to talk about Banshees of Inner Sharon. And he made it very clear, as he has done over the years, that nobody touches the words that he has written. Mm -hmm. There's no ad-libbing. Um, he he, and he, sa he said in this interview, I am the best writer on <laughs> set. Right, yes, these yeah. are my words, and these are the words you're going to stick to. Is that any way the way you were on set? It is the way I work. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I remember um, in uh, when I was first uh, talking to the actors in the film, they were asking about like you know how open are you to like ad lib news line and at the time and I didn't realize that I was lying but I was like yeah let's see let we'll try things and then, and then when we were on set I was like no we're gonna you're gonna say the lines as it is. so you yeah. and Martin McDonough are the same I, you know yes yes uh, did did and did you pick actors with a theatrical background all three of them have a theatrical background, but I think, yeah. This, and this relates to, and I've mentioned this in, in, in previous interviews, uh, Sean Penn was talking about a movie and he had directed uh, Mark Rylance. Uh, the movie it wasn't a great movie, but Sean Penn said in this interview, you can always tell if you're working with someone who's come up through the theatre. So I just wondered if that was something that you would go along with. I think definitely. I do think that film acting is just so, so different, obviously. You know, the metaphor that I use is that theater acting is like Buddhism and film acting is like Christianity. So <laughs> this is going to be wow. good. This okay. is going to so, be good. So theater okay. acting, I don't know. I don't know how well you guys know Buddhism, but theater acting is it's a matter of going to the temple every day. So it don't have to uh, go to the temple in a specific way. But part of Buddhism is that you have to go to a temple every day for a month for you to get one of those wooden beads right so the idea is, is like it doesn't you can go, walk in angry you can walk in uh, happy you can walk in thinking you know awful thoughts but y as long as you show up mm -hmm. to the temple every day you're a good buddhist so that's really the way that i think th theater works so your performance every day in every moment doesn't have to be the best performance you've ever done but what does matter is that you do show up every day and that you're able to run a show every mm -hmm. day and in, in New York, you have to, if you're doing theater, you have to sometimes do like eight shows a week. And eight shows a week, let's say you're, uh, you have to die in the show. You have to die like it's the first time you've ever died, you know, in the show. So in that way, it's really about the consistency. 
in a kind of way that you can live through it and then be resurrected and live it again, right? You know, film acting is like Christianity in that you can round all week and then on Sunday you can go to church. And as long as you go to church on Sunday and you apologize for everything and you just show up and <laughs> you, you kill it there, you really show up for that. And then you're a great Christian. And I think, that, <laughs> I think that's true about film acting in that you can have 10 takes, right? And nine takes could be unusable. But as long as you have the final take where it is transcendent work, then you're an amazing film actor. Yeah. That's the most original that is comparison that I've going, that's ever going, That's going in the end of the year montage. <laughs> now, can I ask you some nerdy things? Okay, so 35mm, yeah. yes. and then it, the film looks beautiful. When the concept of in Yun, and you mentioned, you know, uh, this, there's a sort of discussion about what in Yun means. Am I saying that correctly? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank perfect. you. And in a traditional movie, this idea that souls are somehow being bound together thousands and thousands of times, you, what you think is that the film is telling us, ah, well, there's, a, there's, a, there's an obvious classic story here and there's an interruption to it. And what the film then does is it presents you with a concept which it then plays with in ways that you don't expect. And they have a discussion about, well, maybe the two men have uh, in your... And I... So I love the fact that all the way through there is the tension between those two things. And the final part of the nerdy question is the score is my favourite score album of the year. And it reminded me, and I say this as the highest compliment, it reminded me of um, there's one theme in it when over the montage that happens when they're on Skype, which reminds me of there's a brilliant uh, composer called Eiko Ishibashi who did the music for Drive My Car. And the score for your your movie has some of the the... The, it's like music discovering itself and sort of tentatively edging towards something. Can you tell me something about the score? Because I love the score. It's Christopher yeah. Bear and... Dan Rawson. Dan Rawson. Yeah. Tell me about the music. Yeah, well, I feel like they're the uh, guys from Grizzly Bear. When I was uh, thinking about composers, I think that I wanted somebody who could have a conversation about silences in the film mm -hmm. as much as the score. Because uh, there's so much of the story that happens over the sound of the city itself. Mm -hmm. And the thought is always that it cannot come any sooner than the very last minute that it's meant to come in, the uh -huh. piece of music. And then I think that the other part of it is, I think this does reveal my theater background, where I just know that there is such room for the audience. There has to be room for the audience to get to the emotional place themselves yeah. without music uh, dragging them there. You always want the, the, the audience to feel the longing for the music a s half a second before the music comes, yeah. right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so I think so much of it has to do with the timing itself. And the reason why I wanted to work with uh, Chris and uh, Dan is that because they understand emotional music or uh, music that is very deep and, and felt in a way that's intelligent and not just the, you know, massive wall of feelings. Yeah. Um, the 35 millimeter... Yeah. Is the question? Yes, because you shot in 35 and it just, the film glows. Yeah, I mean, that was something that me and my my um, DP and I were starting to talk about. And I don't think, it because it's a, it's a big headache to work in film mm -hmm. nowadays. And it's very expensive. <laughs> so I think that the decision really did come down to, is it philosophically aligned with the film? And the movie is time made tangible, right? It's yes. so much of it is about... Uh, this ephemeral thing made into something that's physical. And and that sort of is the moment, there's a moment where the two characters meet each other for the first time in 24 years. And I think that those are the things that sort of felt right yeah. for it to be made, shot on film. And your DP is Sh Shabir Kushner? Shabir Kushner. There is a moment where the two men in your movie meet for yeah. the first time. And from what I understand, that is the first time that they actually met. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the actors themselves met each other for the first time uh, when the characters meet for the first time. And we were rolling, and that first uh, take is in the in the film. And we felt that, uh, I, you know, I felt that with the actors that that was so uh, invaluable to do that. Because, again, like, I don't have VFX or fireworks to make the, you know, make, make the scene work in different ways. It, it's just all going to have to live on the actors' faces. So we thought it would be worth the extra effort for that. And the thing is, it's really the, when these actors were meeting for the first time, it's because they have been building their own chemistry with Greta that is outside of each other's. And also they had a lot of expectation that I built for meeting each other. So you're going to see the way that the expectation, the image and the idea of another person become physical and become tangible. 
And how are you going to deal with that? And I think that really was the thought behind it. And this really is my very final question. Have you been amazed by the response to this movie? Because people are talking about, as Mark has already met, you know, maybe one of the films of the year, almost certainly one of the, maybe maybe the film of the year, you know, awards and all that kind of stuff. Are you stunned by that? Or did you think I'm making something really special here? Then I'm finished. (laughs) I think when I was waiting for this movie to have a world premiere at Sundance, and I was uh, in, in the backstage waiting to go on so that it can be shared with the world for the first time. I remember the feeling I had of like, and I think it's always uh, nothing but f- fear because that's the moment where you just don't have any control. Like making the movie, you have so much, you have control of every frame, every sound, literally everything is uh, something, even the title, you know, like everything is something that I can do something about. But then when it comes to it coming out into the world, there's nothing I can do about that, right? And you hope for the best and you think that you set it up uh, for success, but uh, you don't know, right? So I think, but then I think after that moment, uh, once it was shown at the Sundance and it had the response that it did immediately. And I think that from then, I think that everything else has been just like, oh, it's, it's awesome. You know, it's just an amazing thing. Yeah. And you're doing a Star Wars next, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, Celine Song, thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, well, Celine has now uh, left the studio. I have, to, I have to say she embraced us both. Well, she offered you a, a hug, and then I thought, well, I'm not letting you have a hug with the director, Oscar-winning director, probably, yeah. uh, in the future without muscling in on that. I have to say that was, I mean, not only is it a fascinating film, and, and I think that was, a fa- I hope people agree that was a fascinating conversation, but that's the most original thing I've ever heard in any of our conversations that we have ever done when she was likening theatre and cinema to Buddhism and Christianity. Yeah, in terms of the acting. I was, ri- I was writing it down. Because you said it's a very Catholic very version Catholic of Catholic view of Christianity, <laughs> yeah. I think. Do whatever uh, you want, but then turn up and, and do yes. a good performance on the Sunday. <laughs> anyway, I think uh, Martin Luther might have disagreed. <laughs> anyway, but I think you've already gathered that um, that we both... Love the film. I mean, you've kind of said a lot of what you want to say. I yeah, think. I mean, look, just to sort of to, to contextualise. So the story plays out over 24 years and it begins with the voice of somebody looking at three people in a bar. And the voice says, who do you think they are to each other? You know, and they're trying to figure out what the relationship between these people is. Because one of them is Korean. One of them is Korean, uh, Canadian immigrant. One of them is Jewish, American, you know. you. Anyway, um... And then the film goes back 24 years. We meet two of the characters, Hae Sung and Na Young, as she is at that point, who then becomes Nora, when they're childhood friends, and there's clearly a connection between them, but they are about to be separated because her parents are moving to Canada. 12 years later, they meet on Skype, and they have they start having the conversations on Skype, which are those Skype conversations at opposite ends of the world, opposite ends of the day, about everything and nothing but they are separated by thousands of miles. And then we meet them again 12 years later, at which point that takes us back to the bar. And so we've, we've sort of seen this, this journey from several, uh, from several different ways. And clearly what the film is about is several things. One of them being, as uh, I think was so perfectly expressed by Celine Song, that um, you are different things any person contains a number of different things and that and that uh, the 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 contact with the different parts of your life and the contact with different people in your life actually brings out different people in you and i still you know i go back to that phrase but he's so korean when i'm with him i feel so not korean and yet more korean which in a way kind of sums up the whole the the the, the beauty of the film and i think that watching it you just you, you, you she said, I discovered that I was a filmmaker. I fell in love with being a filmmaker. There are some people who are, I think, naturally attuned to cinema. And if that isn't one of them, then I don't know what is. <laughs> because it's it's not just the confidence. And it was very interesting what she was saying about silence in theatre. I was having this conversation. Weirdly, last night I did an, an onstage thing with Brian Cox. And there was a discussion afterwards about how silence in theatre is earned. You earn the you know the space between things and i think the same is true of film that you earn the right to have those kind of the moments in which the you're not having to talk to the audience and i've always said the thing about show don't tell i think there's so much show don't tell going on in this film there is one scene we won't spoil but there's one scene in which two people don't say anything at all and the scene seems to go on for an 
unfeasibly long period of time. But actually, as I think you would have picked up from the conversations about the space, there's a lot of space in this movie, the space yeah. between the characters. And it's, it was a COVID film, but that's not the reason. But they are standing a long way apart from each yeah. other. And when the Korean friend and Greta meet for the first time, they are standing a long way away from each other for a long time. Yeah. And that sort of is almost like a, a physical manifestation of what you're talking about in terms of the silences that we have. Yeah, and I think that that, I mean, it was lovely, again, I mean, so in a way, so all the stuff I'm saying is stuff that we've already been told by the director, but when I said I love the score, and I love the score, in the same way that I love the Eko Ishibashi's uh, score for Drive My Car, the phrase that she uses is that the audience have to want the music to come in for half a second before it comes in. And that sense of, the, it's the longing that you need. It's the yearning. It's the, it's the audience wanting something. Didn't you feel that you spent an awful lot of the movie wanting things to, you know, to be manifested? Well, I knew that you would be talking about, uh, talking about the music, but I did... It was interesting that she didn't want to use the music to take you to a place. She wanted the acting and the story yeah. to take you there. Yeah. So that the the film was kind of, the, uh, the, the score was kind of filling in behind the story rather yes. than actually leading the story. And that reminds me of something that, you know, Bill Forsyth has said. Um, I said I was just back from Shetland and Bill Forsyth said this thing once that every time I told him that I love the score for Local Hero, a little part of him was heartbroken because he had this feeling that, that you use music when the film isn't doing the job that you put the music on. But actually what, what was being described there is the perfect use of cinema music is that it's not dragging you to a place, but when you're at the place, it's amplifying what's happening, but it's amplifying it in such an understated way. Seriously, th this, is, th this is a major filmmaking talent who seems to have arrived fully formed yes. after an apprenticeship in theatre. And, you know, you are going to be hearing a lot more about Selling Song in future. And one, one final thing. So we're nine months into the year. Maybe it's the film of the year. But also see it on a big screen if you can. Yeah. Don't don't wait for it to come on. I mean, I, I actually did watch it on my laptop because that was the only way I could uh, get to see it. You saw it in a cinema. See oh, it on yeah. the big screen. Make it take up all of your yeah. uh, eyesight. Yes. Don't, don't allow your, you know, don't be... It is an utterly immersive experience. Yeah, exactly. and, it's, and it is, yeah, it's fabulous. It's just fabulous. So it's the ads in a minute, uh, Mark. But mm -hmm. first it's time to step once again, and I know you've missed this so much, mm -hmm. into our laughter lift. Please. The lift of laughter. Here we go. Where laughs go to die. Wow, that's a big ping. <laughs> that was very loud. That's the loudest ping. <laughs> uh, Mark, we know you had a, a, a lovely break. I had a very relaxing one. The high point was... Perhaps when I had a drink with my top 80s chums, musical youth, over the break. <laughs> do you know why they're such big fans of the A388 northbound in Cornwall? I do. Yes, obviously, because you passed, passed the, the Duchy on left the left-hand left -hand side. side. Thing is, my real-life that... story interviewing <laughs> the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster is better than that. <laughs> anyway, things not going very well uh, with a good lady, ceramicist, her indoors. In between top vessel making, uh, she's been spending every waking hour inventing a two-seater anti-gravity vehicle that can work in vertical surfaces. <laughs> okay. A two-seater anti-gravity vehicle that can, can work, work on vertical, vertical surfaces. surfaces. She's driving me up the wall. I thought I'd try and patch things up with a slap-up meal in Showbiz North London. Didn't go very well. The food arrived and I said, let's eat. But at home, said the good lady, you always pray before eating. That's at home, I said. Here, the chef knows what he's doing. <laughs> that, okay, that's, there we are. Well done. Is that the joke the child three uh, likes? Yeah, that's, that's very right, good. That's, right. that's it. What's still to come? Uh, with the nun too. I mean, that kind of is enough to keep <laughs> that's everybody... That's right. That's a whole, is there on other stuff in there? No, it's tender. the nun too. It'll the be back too. after this, unless you're a Vanguardista, in which case we have just one question. A cowboy rode into town on Friday. He stayed for three nights and he rode out on Friday. How is this possible? But the horse was called Friday. That, we do that after the... We oh, okay. do that as like... Okay. I mean, I know but that's it's like, obviously what it is. I know it's obviously okay. what it is. All right. The whole leave idea this in is to leave it as a... one of the only times I've ever actually got that, it's right? It's a tease to it's drag tease people to drag through. Them, with the emphasis on drag. I know, because drag people me in are hole. just about accessing that fast forward 30 second button okay and now then you know so the idea is to like to tease yeah. them into the next yeah. bit and now you've sort of spoiled okay. that all right so the horse isn't called friday okay not until we restart it might be renamed in a couple okay. of minutes all right after this <laughs> And of course, the horse's name was Shergar. Shergar. 
Oh, Friday. <laughs> you just spoiled the whole thing. Yeah. And, and then, Set up, and pay then, off. Is there another joke when he, 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 he loses his horse and then he finds his horse and he says, thank God it's Friday or something like that? No. My favourite horse joke, and I... Is it Chris Rock? I don't know. Somebody... Go on. It was an American comic who said, talking about the song, the America song, Being Through the Desert with a Horse. A Horse with No Name. Say, you'd think that after being with a horse in the desert for that long, you you'd do. have thought of a name for a horse. <laughs> this is from Ollie. In the, in yeah. the last take, Mark asked about the status of Barnet FC. Oh, the, yes, I did. The bees and their I history. Did. Barnet are, at the time of writing, top of the National League, the fifth division. This is the same league Barnet played in when Mark was growing up in the borough, although the league had a different name then. Who's this email from? I just said it's from Ollie. OK, fine, go on. Barnet have had three spells in the Football League and three subsequent relegations back to non-league. Their highest position was in the 93-94 season when they reached what is now called League One, obviously the third division. OK. Unfortunately, that summer they effectively went bankrupt under the ownership of notorious ticket tout Stan Flashman <laughs> and lost most of their best players on free transfers and were subsequently second best in most games that season and relegated. We Barnet fans have high hopes for a return to the Football League under Dean Brennan, but despite our good start, we remain far from favourites with the bookies. Best wishes, Ollie. OK, well, I got this from Nick Kennedy, who was the person that I mentioned was my, the fan. Is he, in, is he in that band that you were talking about called Home? Home? No. He's not in that. No, that's Dave Cummins, and he wasn't in the band, he just had the album. Hi, Mark. Just heard your podcast mentioning Barnet FC and my undying support for them. In answer to your query, they're not in the league anymore, but they were a few years ago. I still watch them and support them whenever I can. Best wishes, Nick Kennedy. But they are top of the National League, which is the fifth division. Well, there we go. So, you know. So, thank you. We get, I'm glad to be up to speed with them, with uh, the Barnet Bees. And, uh, and also, if you have any more to tell us about Barnet, then we are very happy to take it at <laughs> correspondence at coedomayo.com, which is also the email where you can send your Watsons, which we'll be getting to after we've talked about the clergy or the female clergy in habits. The Nun 2. Um, what happened in The Nun 1? Quite, quite, quite. None. I see. Quite, quite, quite. No, that's what happened. Or as as somebody, and this wasn't my joke, it was somebody else's joke, somebody wrote in and said they missed a trick by not calling it the nunjuring because it was from the it, from from the conjuring. It was, you know, the nun was one of the that's good. things that came out of the... So then they started, it's a whole thing. So, um, 2018 was the nunjuring. This is more of the same. There's a bit of the, in the opening which tells us that we're in France in 1956. That was pretty much as much of the plot as I understood or cared about. Um... After that, there is... Well, should we hear a clip that kind of explains how it is that the, that the action of The Nun 2 plays out? Can I eat a pastry during the clip? You can. OK, go ahead. Sister Irene? Your eminence. Yeah, really? I was, lucky, I was lucky I made it out of The Nun awake. So... Pretty how much, much how much more scary could it be? None, none more scary. scary. That was indeed one of the one of the puns in in the review. So, oh right, okay, sure. Well, well done for remembering that. How's how's the how's the pastry doing? Incidentally, it's doing rather well. Is actually. it good? Okay, carry on then. So, same as before, uh, Marilyn Manson is hiding in a bunch of shadows, uh, waiting to to jump out at you. And um, there's lots of people standing around with their backs turned towards you. And then you, you the people talk to them, go hello, 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 and then they turn around and go ah. Um, mm -hmm. So the first half is all... That's just like being back at Radio 2. <laughs> <laughs> the first half is, is dark. Quiet, dark, quiet, dark, quiet, dark. None! <laughs> quiet. Dark. See, I quite like that trailer. Quiet. I thought it was quite quiet. exciting. Quiet. 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 None too! And then... It, then was it, a, it was the lispy bishop. With the lispy... The lispy, the lispy, the lispy there should be a series of incidents. I wonder if you could... And I bet it again. wasn't cholera that killed the bishop. <laughs> Definitely not cholera. <laughs> anyway, so... Then, uh, then there's a bit which goes a bit nuns on the run, as <laughs> our two habited surely not yes, uh, two nuns in search of the of of, of the of the bad of the bad thing in search of Marilyn Manson hiding in a corner, um, and and then jumping out and shouting none, and then in the final act, if anyone's ever seen Exorcist three, the final act of Exorcist three is stuck in by the studio because it takes place in a cell and it's meant to be a conversation, but well, it's meant to be a scene in which Detective Kinderman walks into the cell and, and shoots the reanimated body of Father Karras. But the studio said, no, no, we need an exorcism. So what happens is a priest, played by Nicole Williamson, turns up 
and uh, he gets stuck against the wall and then he gets flayed against the ceiling and then the floor opens up and then a massive pair of uh, rowing oars in the shape of a crucifix come out with a thing of uh, Father Karras in, in, and then flames shoot out and, and somebody once said that the studio wouldn't have been happy unless Madonna came out and sang a song. Oh no, it was George C. Scott said that. Anyway, so the last act of uh, Nunjuring 2 is, is basically that. It's just like huge, people, ca people fly and people catch fire and there's a bit in which there are these vats of, of holy wine and they but they turn into water cannons and you know really? and that all happens there's yeah. also a demonic goat um not, is that a first in your experience no no there's a very scary billy goat in uh, in the vavitch but in this there's a very unscary silly goat which goats is just, always as we've discussed before on this program always are very significant when you see a goat in a film, yes. Well, yes, it's the you know it's the it's the thing. There's a there's one scene when they have to find they have to find where a thing is. There's a stained glass window with a goat. And they have to shine a torch so the goat's eyes light up and it creates a laser beam, a laser beam to point to where the bad thing is buried. Right. At least with the Pope's Exorcist, um, when it went all end of Exorcist three, it was funny and it was kind of entertaining. This this isn't this isn't funny. This is this is nunny. Um, Incidentally, I did an I did an on stage introduction to the fiftieth anniversary of The Exorcist, and somebody wrote afterwards that because I have now become the film's emissary on earth, it's not so much the Pope's exorcist as the Exorcist Pope, which I thought was a very fine line. And I'm going to use that. So, I'm watching the film. I was I was sitting next to Alan Jones. I was so bored. It was so so boring, and so I just ended up doing nun jokes to keep myself awake. Okay, so here they are. None too. I was none too scared. I was none too interested. In fact, I kept nodding off because there was none to see. <laughs> Thank you very much. I thought it might be a good popcorn film, but the movie was too boring for snacks. There was none eaten. <laughs> the best way to see it would be on one of those loyalty cards, you know, that give you free access to the cinema, you know, when there's none to pay. <laughs> Although even then you'd, you'd want your money back. And I tried to get a joke about toupee and somebody not having hair but that didn't work out i arrived early though when i got to the screening and they were doing the, they were doing the sound check yeah. none none two none none two okay I'm... actually i went with alan jones and he had exactly the same experience as i did um when i asked him how many times he jumped he went none two can play at that game how many more of these do i want none none what are the chances that this is the end of it none two here all week tip your waitress is that it? You actually finished now. Let's not make a habit of it. And there he is. That's a... yeah. Okay, shut up. <laughs> the redactor is coming up with <laughs> none two jokes, which are of the they're the kind of jokes that would have got rejected from the laughter lift. Yes, that's that's where yeah. they are. So, the review in brief is pish. Thank you. Correspondence at kermanandmayor.com. Um, let's check in with our What's On um, team, okay. because uh, this is where we basically say, hey, if you have a cinematic thing that's going on that you're connected to or you know about, wherever you are in the universe, let us know. Is the universe? Us, yes. Yeah, why not? Screenings let, on Pluto. Ex let's expand. Let's not be prejudiced against people who might be, you know, other people on other species who are living elsewhere. The way you said that was very Jonathan Richmond. Oh, I take that as a comment. I love New England best. I might be prejudiced. Correspondence at KevinMayor.com. For example, we have these correspondents. Hello, Simon and Mark. It's Jack here from White Screen Weekend in Bradford, a festival of big films, big screens and rare formats. This September, we're screening films like The Hateful Eight and Roma on 70mm, The Hidden Fortress and The Young Girls of Rochefort on 35mm, and we're currently the only place in the world where you can still see three projector cinerama. Search Widescreen Weekend for more details and for tickets or passes. This is Dirt in the Gate Movies, and our annual 35mm Grindfest is back in September at the Regent Centre in Christchurch, Dorset. We'll be screening prints of The Terminator, Repo Man, House, Dead End Driving, The Thing, Serpent in the Rainbow, Street Trash, Life Force, Friday the 13th 3 in 3D, and more. Check out regentcentre.co.uk for details. At a cinema near here. So uh, that's exactly what we're talking about. Jack telling us about the widescreen weekend festival in Bradford. Dan plugging the annual Grindfest festival in Christchurch. Uh, if you have something to uh, to pass on, let us know and send your twenty second audio trailer or thereabouts. Really, they were pretty good. Wherever you are, they in were the universe, into that very they well. Were. Correspondence at kermanandmayo dot com. That is 
Oh, sorry, I banged, <laughs> banged the microphone. I was so excited. That is the end of Take One. It has been a Sony Music Entertainment production. The team behind this extraordinary podcast. Why have you gone into this voice? Lily Hamley, Ryan O'Meara, Gully Tickell, Beth Perkin, Mickey Movies, Hannah Talbot, Simon Paul, who is the redactor. Three. <laughs> Mark, what is your film of the week? Well, you will be none too surprised none to too. that it's past lives. Of course it is. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Take Two will be with you. Well, Take Two is already with it's you. It's already with you. It has landed alongside this podcast. Take Three on Wednesday. Thanks very much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed making it. While you're here, check out all the other videos because they're cool too, aren't they? They are. And if you want to keep up to date with everything Kermit and Mayo's take, then check out our social channels. I mean, why wouldn't you? I mean, I, I would. No, I have done. Excellent.